Ellis. Um, I'm actually the um, supervisor of a New Harvest Fellow, Scott Allen, who started about two weeks ago. Um, so I'm here, to, I'm speaking really on, on his behalf. And our area of interest and our area of research is actually bioprocessing, talking to you today about um, bioreactors. Um, but I think it's important to point out that designing a bioreactor is not an isolated um, uh, process. It's actually part of um, a much bigger process, a bioprocess. And really what we're talking about here is tissue engineering bioprocessing. So um, my background, I'm a chemical engineer, but my background has been in regenerative medicine, cell therapies, and more recently, um, organoids for, for drug discovery. So really growing a variety of um, mammalian cells, expanding them on a large scale um, for, um, for commercial and clinical use. So um, first of all, let's, we need to look first of all at tissue engineering bioprocessing. Um, as you've seen from the, the three talks, a large amount of work in biology is done in plastic um, flasks. Um, but what you get are um, differences when people are growing these up. Every individual, doesn't matter how well trained you are, will grow those cells up slightly differently. Um, you'll also, so essentially what you're going to get is a lot of batch-to-batch -batch variation, um, which isn't conducive to, um, to large-scale manufacturing um, production. It's also very manual, and so the cost and the time is directly proportional to the number of cells that you grow. And anyone who's done manual cell culture will know that an awful lot of the time is, is spent really pipetting, um, changing media, and just making sure that you're not infecting your cells when you have weeks and weeks and weeks of culture, because one infection wipes out everything. Um, so what um, a bioprocess does is really automates, or probably more realistically, semi-automates the process of growing cells, um, which should, if done well, result in high quality um, and high volumes of cells. So you're, you're reducing the, the variability in your product um, significantly. And ultimately, and this is where the reactor comes in, um, the, the bigger the reactor, the less manual processing is required. So you need more space, um, you need um, it takes down your manual labor, reduces your costs. So next few slides, I'm actually just going to really cover these kind of good aspects of um, tissue engineering bioprocessing in terms of space consumables, manual processing, importantly with the bioreactor, an in vivo-like environment. I'm going to give you some examples from other work so you can understand um, how we, we should be looking to do this ultimately high quality and cost effective because it actually it really it doesn't matter how amazing the science is if we can't do this in a cost effective way we are not going to get products um, onto the shelf so as a chemical engineer when we're looking at bioprocess design we go through this iterative process um, in these boxes and it's um, we're really going to focus um, on this area here today but really, it involves a lot of different disciplines to do this well, and with um, other scientists, mathematicians, and social scientists as well. But ultimately, you go around here, you have an iterative process of designing the reactor with suitable flow rates, understanding the fluid dynamics and mass um, and thermodynamics and mass transfer conditions, um, and the other surrounding bits of equipment as well, which I'll show you an example of in a moment. Um, really, these kind of these two blocks in um, blue here. Um, you need to work backwards from your desired outcome and from the product that you want to make, and you go around this until you have something that you are able to build. Um, so let's just think about when we are building a bioprocess that contains a bioreactor. So Hannah Tremisto, um, who's a life cycle analyst, who's here today, um, and worth going to speak to, her, to speak to her if you haven't already, um, is, is by far the most established person looking at life cycle analysis. Um, in 2014, um, I did a little bit of work with her looking at um, the energy requirements of um, a hollow fiber bioreactor. We'll come on to that in a moment. Um, and what I really want to point out here are, um, is how um, growing muscle cells is going to be, um, the process is going to look different in different um, environments and the product is likely to look, di look different as well. So the two that I really want to pick out here is that um, with our reactor design, um, we had actually quite a high en energy requirement. Um, and even though the water use was reduced, um, it really wasn't as low as some of the, um, the other estimates that have come out. 
It's also lower than some, but um, so what it's worth pointing out was that this was based at Ilta Dunsford's farm, who you'll be hearing from later today. Um, so we have um, an average temperature in Wales of around, around 11 degrees C, 2 to 18 degrees C, which essentially is temperate. On the cold side, you're going to need a coat and probably um, a hat and an umbrella. Um, we also did this without recycle, which means that we were essentially taking water in the media into the system and just chucking it out the other end. Now, consider a different environment. So, um, Takana is a region of Kenya. Um, they um, have, it's a very um, water um, poor environment. Um, they also have much warmer temperatures, so averaging around 30 degrees C, so that's hot, um, that's shorts and t-shirts, weather, sunglasses, and a sensible hat. Um, and if you were to grow cells here, it's very, very different in terms of process design. So cells grow at 37 degrees C. Um, typically, at lower densities, they need heating, and we all know we have to supply heat and energy to grow the cells. But you're going to need a lot less of it here, and particularly if you've then got the sun beaming down and the, actually the ground temperature in sunlight is going to be a lot higher. So what the design that we're looking at and the energy requirements are going to be different around the world. It's also, I think, worth noting that the product is going to look different as well. So, so far, really, today, we've been looking at growing meat, as we know it, in terms of muscle. But there's an alternative approach to this. So, um, in Kenya, there's a refugee camp, um, Kakuma Refugee Camp. Um, and they currently have supplied into them around 18 million sachets of, um, of, new, of uh, micronutrients to add into their, um, their daily meals. So it's not a million miles away to think about supplying into them um, and perhaps them growing it locally is a muscle cell protein powder to add into that product. Um, that is going to be different for different, um, for different markets around the world. So it's climate and it's also product, and we really have to think about that final product, as I just showed on that uh, previous diagram. And this is what a bioprocess looks like. So this is a piping and instrumentation diagram. Um, this is probably our third iteration um, we've done at the University of Bath. I've had a couple of brilliant um, undergraduate teams working with me on this. This is theoretical. We have not built this yet. OK, um, we're going to look at this in more detail, but you can see it's actually quite a complex process. Um, and this is the reactors here. We have, um, we have storage tanks, we have mixers, heat exchangers, membrane exchange, but it's a complex process. And this is what we are looking to need to build to, um, to grow muscle cells. OK, but let's now zoom in on the reactor. Um, there's all sorts of different types of reactor that you can um, use and grow cells in. We've seen quite a few pictures of tissue culture flasks, um, but there's a whole other host. So Marie essentially um, showed up, um, I think it's a fluoralized bed, might be in a stirred tank. Essentially, there was continuous flow. Um, continuous stirred tank reactors are what, tra are what are traditionally and commonly used in, um, in the pharma industry. Okay, and they are, they're very well established and they're relatively cheap to buy. But I want to draw your attention to these volumes here. So I'm gonna, in a minute, I'm going to show you um, some energy requirements um, that it would take to grow 10 kilograms of, or to produce 10 kilograms of protein in muscle cells. But I've taken the number of cells needed to do that, so 1.59 times 10 to the 13, and I've just compared the volume of reactors needed to do that. So Marie's absolutely right. We do not want to be producing um, uh, large-scale um, muscle cells by um, tissue culture flasks because you're looking at nearly 160,000 litres of flasks per 10 kilograms of protein. Um, the example that we've, um, I'm going to show you in a minute is actually working with a membrane reactor, which you need a lot less space. Essentially, you can get more cells per unit volume into this um, space, which reduces um, the volume, the amount of um, capital expenditure, and potentially the amount of media. So let's look in at, some, at some diagrams of here um, of this. So this, this is really just taking those numbers and looking at the relative volumes. So this is your flask, and that's um, only a small number of those, I believe, that um, were used to produce um, Mark's burger. 
Um, these are examples of industrial bioreactors, really just to give you some comfort um, that we are, that it's not impossible to get to these scales. So you can see they're all kind of people-sized reactors. So this is a stirred tank, uh, very well established in, in pharma. A fluidized bed, okay, there's no person here, um, but essentially we could comfortably get one in the, the height of this building. We, you know, that's not going to be unusual, a um, couple of meters in diameter. And these membrane bioreactors, well, that's, that's a, um, a, a normal-sized person there, I'm guessing. Um, so you have these different types of membrane reactors, and actually these can be um, comfortably um, as well, certainly up to the edge of here, it can be tens of meters long as well. So we know we can produce these at scale. There are, of course, um, there's a lot of design needed to actually um, make this so that it, it works to grow um, cells that we're in, interested in. Um, so the next couple of slides are just looking at some bioreactor design um, for, a, um, for two other tissue types. One is liver, which is an adherent tissue type. I'm also going to show you a non-adherent type. So however we go with our cells, we, can, we know we can work with both. Um, so this is looking at a, a hollow fiber membrane bioreactor. This type of reactor provides the highest cell density for any reactor type. Essentially what you'll think, what, you're, what you should imagine is a, take a bunch of drinking straws, hold them in your hand, shrink them down to about a millimeter in diameter, and they're porous, and then put them in a glass housing and, and put the cells around the outside of them. And these are porous, um, just like our blood vessels, and we actually term this pseudo-vascularization. It's a relatively well-established um, in regenerative medicine now. Um, but what we can see from, from this data, so these blue lines here, essentially are the feed famine cycle in standard cell culture. So the glucose depletion, depending on when you do your, your hand feeding, um, and the lactate um, increase because you're getting this uh, feed famine cycle of the media building up. Um, the, the, the other colored lines are essentially showing that in a reactor, these are more stabilized, and in fact, these can be completely controlled. Um, also importantly, we can control the oxygen requirements in this system. So for liver, this is particularly important because the way our liver functions is actually directly relevant to the oxygen gradient along it. But it's also important for muscle cells, which actually require a relatively large amount of oxygen. So we know, um, and working with mathematicians, that we can very, very accurately design these systems. And the beauty of this particular reactor is that each fiber behaves like the next fiber, so it is really easily scalable. Okay? We, we don't get variations um, spatially, or very little. Okay, so that's an adherent cell type. Um, this is an example of a non-adherent cell type. So Tregs, if you're interested, are an immune cell um, type. They're actually the off switch for um, organ rejection. But the reason I want to show you this is because they're very um, high in demand for, late, for manual labor. They need feeding every day. And this just really shows what a bioreactor can do in terms of, um, of manual labor. So typically um, in the lab, you're going in every single day. That's a bit longer at the end of one week. And so every day you have to go in and you have to feed these cells. In a bioreactor, so these are the reactors we had um, growing in, um, in Bath, you only have to go in twice, okay, which if you're a company, it's great because you need fewer people or they can be doing other things. And if you're the person doing cell culture, you're very happy because this is actually very laborious and it ties you to being into that, into that one space um, um, every single day. You can also see that we have um, nearly a quarter reduction in media requirements um, because of the way that we can actually um, tune this reactor. And so this isn't um, fully um, optimized, so we're imagining we can get much higher um, uh, reductions in media. Okay, so back to our beautiful um, bioprocess. Um, let's just put a uh, bit more useful information for you up here. Um, so we've heard Kate talk about media formulation. Happens in these tanks over here. So the reactors we've just been talking about. But we've got other opportunities that we can improve bioprocess design. Um, waste valorization and recycling. So we've talked about water recycling, but let's think about the waste products and how we can use them. Um, there's also the other aspects as well, um, broadly looking around infrastructure location, supply chain, legislation, all of those things, and, and social science as well. 
Um, and something you'll probably hear about a little bit later is product formulation. So I've mentioned um, what we might be looking at in, um, in uh, Kakuma refugee camp, but it's definitely something we need to be thinking about earlier on. So this relates to Scott's product, uh, uh, pro uh, project. So when you're working out the amount of media required, there's two ways that you can do this. Um, so either you can do as we do in the lab and you can just swap the total volume of media um, to the, the same number of days, um, which will then really greatly depend on the size of your reactor. Or you can base it on the reaction stoichiometry, which is what we've got here. And so this will actually then depend um, on the, the reaction um, metabolism of the cells. This, this reaction, metabolism, reaction metabolism is not actually known for muscle cells. And essentially, that's what Scott's product, uh, project's going to be working on. So just to summarize in terms of some numbers for you. So um, we've essentially got an awful lot of media Okay, so 62,000 kilograms, 62 tons of media um, going in to produce uh, 10 kilograms of the protein at the moment. But we have got water recycling, so we can really bring that water use down. And here we've got um, waste um, valorization. So essentially this ammonia could go into making a fertilizer. If it's in Kakuma, in, to, um, in Tokana, that can actually be used to fertilize the land around that factory to grow their goats because they, they're goat herders. Um, and lactic acid, um, you probably know, is the biodegradable polymer that can be used uh, to make bottles and bags and can be used in rapid prototyping. It can also be used to make scaffolds. So waste valorization is not only good because we are not throwing things away, it can make the company more uh, money. So just to conclude um, what I have said, so tissue engineering based cellular agriculture, um, we need to replicate the environment in vivo if we're going to get good um, muscle cell growth. Reactor design is important um, and the scalability needs to be included from very, very early on. Um, I should just mention um, this, by the way, is um, an architecture's design of a, um, a cellular agriculture plant in Dorchester. Um, in Dorset in the UK. Um, we have here uh, some fluidized uh, bed bioreactors. These, by the way, are algae bioreactors, okay, which are, we're looking to supply nutrients or grow um, from the algae into the system. Okay. Algae um, uses carbon dioxide and produces oxygen. Muscle cells use oxygen, produce carbon dioxide, so we start to have this circular process. And just finally, um, good bioprocessing will make a product viable, um, but great bioprocessing will make a product competitive. Okay, just need to thank everybody who's been involved in this work, and thank you all for listening.